welcome you to what I know is going to be a really wonderful lecture. Um, before I introduce Rosemary Garland Thompson, I want to thank the English department for co-sponsoring this event. And I also want to let you know about two upcoming events that are related to gender studies on campus. Uh, the first one is Aiden Kosieska is going to give a talk titled Transgender Identity, A Personal Story of Transition on Monday, December 3rd at 7 o'clock. And I'm pretty sure that's going to be held in St. Augustine Center uh, 300, but you have to look for confirmation about the location for that because we don't have that um, nailed down yet. Second, Tim McCall, a faculty member here at Villanova and a wonderful art historian, is going to give a talk at Falvey Library on Tuesday, December 4th at noon. His talk is titled Buttons Forming Bodies. Princely fashion in early Renaissance Italy. And it's going to reveal historical fashion's connections to modern fashion and our ideas about to our ideas about our clothes and our own bodies, which I think is going to be really great. And okay, now I have the honor of introducing Rosemary Garland Thompson, the Greater Philadelphia Women's Studies Consortium 2012 Scholar in Residence. She's a professor of women's studies at Emory University. Um, and her work really helped to invent what is the now flourishing field of disability studies. Along the way, Professor Thompson has made tremendous contributions to women's studies, to disability studies, and to cultural studies. She's been called, quote, one of the visionaries who is changing the world. And the statement is not an exaggeration. She has allowed us to see people, all people, in new ways in her fearless explorations of the many dimensions of the human experience. She is the author of Extraordinary Bodies, Figuring Physical Disability in American Culture and Literature, which was published by Columbia University Press in 1997, and more recently, Staring, How We Look, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2009, which is a study of the cultural and historical meanings of shared visual exchange. She is giving three more public lectures in Greater Philadelphia this week, and the one that's nearest to us will be her lecture on the conservation of disability um, at Haverford <coughs> College tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. And that is also going to be, she's going to be giving some informal remarks related to an art exhibit at Haverford, which is going to be ongoing for several more weeks, and I just wanted to call everybody's attention to that. Um, I think it's going to be really great. It's called What Can a Body Do? It's actually already been um, uh, featured in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I think that it's really worth attending. It's just down the road from us, so you guys should think about going to <coughs> that uh, exhibit called What Can a Body Do? Okay. So, Professor Thompson's lecture uh, today is titled Extraordinary Bodies, Images of Disability in Art and Popular Culture. Please join me in welcoming Rosemary Garland Thompson. Um. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, generous introduction, uh, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be here um, through the generosity of the Greater Philadelphia Women's <coughs> Studies Consortium, um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful as well to uh, Villanova University and to you for coming uh, to, uh, to listen to my lecture today. We're trying to get the lights, messing with the lights a little bit to get them so that the uh, images, and this is a very image-driven presentation, will be a little bit brighter for you. So I'm hoping someone will come in and start fooling with the lights a little bit in a minute or two. Um, but in any case, let me begin. Uh, I'm going to read you my lecture as we do in the humanities, uh, so <coughs> I'll begin. Pictures, I want to suggest, are visual narratives. They tell stories to their viewers about what they depict. Pictures tell their stories not with words, of course, but through visual elements and conventions. The stories that public pictures tell shape the way we understand one another. The images that surround us both reflect received perceptions and they mold new ways of thinking about one another. The question that I want to address today in the most general sense is about the cultural work of aesthetic representation. What I ask specifically is the effect that pictures of disability may have on the way we think of the human variations that we think of as disabilities. 
Specifically, I'm going to focus today on a highly conventional, elite form of aesthetic representation. Feel free to just fool with those if you want to. Which is classical portraiture and how it acts as a mediation, a representation between a disabled subject and a viewer that can construct, that can, pardon me, that can reconstruct <coughs> dominant understandings of disability and I want to suggest the lives of people with disabilities. Until recently in the US, a limited range of public visual narratives constricted the way we view people with disabilities. The most prevalent pictures of people with disabilities have come to us through the genres of freak show photography, charity campaigns, or medical photography. These images portray disability narrowly as <coughs> sensational, sentimental, or pathological. Ways of seeing disability have expanded, however, as people with disabilities have entered a newly accessible civic realm. We've got some entertainment. Mm -hmm. The public visual landscape has enlarged in the wake of the legal, material, and social changes that the larger civil and human rights initiatives of the last 50 years have brought about in the United States and the developed world in general. Laws, policies, and the built environment aspire to full, it, to full integration and participation by mandating the removal of material and institutional barriers that excluded people with disabilities from the civic arenas of employment, politics, commerce, education, and community life. As people with disabilities have literally come out of nursing homes, segregated schools, and other restrictive environments, they have simultaneously come out politically to advocate for social justice and for disability rights. As more people with disabilities have become visible in the public eye, so too have varied images emerged that tell a broader range of stories about people with disabilities. An ethic of multiculturalism and a politics of diversity influence the public images available to viewers and tell potentially fresh stories about disabled people and the lives that they lead. Varied images of people with disabilities that don't replicate the old corrosive stories of suffering, inferiority, pity, or repugnance appear routinely now in print advertisements on television and in the visual arts. And of course, this is um, some pictures from the rather popular television program called Glee. Is it still on the air? Oh, good. Yes. Public pictures of people with disabilities that tell positive stories, that show disabled people as valued citizens with meaningful and satisfying lives, work against the damaging received visual narratives that we have available to us about disability. So, reconstructive narratives, part two. To consider the cultural work of pictures, I'm going to present here to you today a number of formal portraits of people with disabilities that have appeared in public spaces in the decades around the turn of the 21st century. These portraits act as what the philosopher and bioethicist Jackie Leach Scully calls reconstructive narratives. Such narratives, according to Scully, offer, and I'm quoting, alternative and morally less harmful accounts that serve what she calls to displace more damaging <coughs> portrayals of people with disabilities. So by closely reading the stories that these portraits present about their subjects, I want to show you today how a conservative aesthetic genre can act in the service of a progressive politics of inclusion. The argument that I'm going to bring forward to you today is that bringing such pictures of people with disabilities into the public realm 
via traditional portraiture is an act of socio-political integration. To be recognized as a member of a traditionally discredited social group such as the disabled reduces, of course, one's social capital. In contrast, being the subject of a public portrait symbolizes membership in a high status group, literally framing the subject of a portrait as an appropriate member of the public sphere who is worthy of contemplation and commemoration. To illustrate how these portraits confer this symbolic capital on disabled subjects, I'm going to show you how these portraits use several fundamental elements of traditional portraiture to portray disabled subjects to portray disabled subjects in a way that re-narrates disability, making disability legible in new ways. Now the four elements of Western portraiture I'm going to talk about are frame, pose, costume, and likeness. And my central claim here is that by achieving a recognizable likeness of their subjects as people with disabilities, these portraits that I'm going to show you today make it possible for viewers to understand disabled people as citizens worthy of public recognition and hence of inclusion in the civic arena. So, classical portraiture. Classical portraiture is an elite, highly convention-bound genre of public art that's both influential and conservative. A portrait is an object that bestows cultural capital not only on its owners, but also on its subjects. The portraits we see in public places such as museums, libraries, universities, boardrooms, government spaces, and even elite private homes generally do the work of supporting the status quo by representing, through familiar aesthetic forms, individuals who have power and value in the ascendant political and social order. as this portrait of Napoleon painted in 1806. Typically, a progressive political agenda appears in contrast expressed through forms such as the avant-garde, outsider art, or art that is some way formally transgressive. But the portraits under consideration here today, what's of interest about these portraits is that they use a very conservative artistic genre in the service of a radical purpose. These representations present people that are unknown and are of the underclass rather than society's more prominent members. At the same time, however, the portraits confirm the commemorative function of the genre that the formal conventions convey. In other words, form and content are at odds in these visually arresting, let, con let yet conventionally deployed portraits. Another way of saying this is that these portraits offer unexpected, even disturbing content in an expected and undisturbing form. For example, of course, this picture of a person that we would generally understand as having a significant facial <coughs> disfigurement is shown in a formal portrait called Vamp that presents her in a sophisticated and sexually alluring pose. So, part three, what do portraits want? Portraits, I'm going to suggest, stage face-to-face -face relationships with the viewer that capture elements of living interpersonal relations. The paintings thus announce that their subjects are important to look at and to recognize as particular individuals, and that's an important point I'll come back to. To use W.J.T. Mitchell's <laughs> concept then, portraits want to be seen. <coughs> 
So these pictures I'm going to share with you today demand recognition. Portraits themselves, apart from the intentions of the artist or the subject, say, and this is again my point, look at me and see who I am. Portraits command recognition via a set of traditional visual conventions, then, that depend for the effect upon viewers recognizing not just the subject of the portrait, but the fact that they are viewing a portrait. So a portrait tells viewers a story in two ways. First, it shows the distinctive characteristics of the subject in order to make that subject as legible as possible to the viewer. Second, it tells viewers that the subject of the portrait is worthy of commemoration, as I've suggested, and of honor because a portrait has been made of that person. This is what classical portraits do then. They confer, confer dignity, value, and recognition on their subjects. Now, portraits accomplish this cultural work through what can be termed visual intertextuality. That is, they depend for their effect on the viewer having seen other portraits and understood the cultural work of portraiture as an elite form of representation. Visual intertextuality, as I'm using it here today then, is the key to the cultural work of classical portraiture in that these pictures refer to another image for their <coughs> meaning as much as, or perhaps even more than, their material referent. Another way of saying this is that seeing portraits has taught us how to see portraits. Knowing what and how a portrait means is part, of course, of our collective cultural, uh, our collective acculturation. Portraits collectively do their storytelling then through a set of familiar conventions that make a portrait mean. Now for the rest of my talk to you today, I'm going to examine with you the interrelated elements that I mentioned of frame, pose, costume, and likeness, and give you some examples through which portraits do their cultural work. So first, frame. Classical portraits are enclosed in a literal frame, which serves to kind of clip out, as it were, the subject from its surrounding environment and to recontextualize it into another space. The act of framing establishes meaning in several ways. First, it selects aspects of the person portrayed and the person's surrounding environment by eliminating some elements and including others. This sorting process gives emphasis and symbolic status to the selected props, poses, costume, background, and so on, and it attenuates the significance of other aspects of the subject that don't appear in the picture. In other words, framing structures the elements of the visual narrative that the portrait presents to the viewer. Part of the frame of meaning in a classical portrait is, of course, the convention of oil painting. Oil painting is an oil is an elite medium that bespeaks an elite process, requiring deliberation, resources, sitting time, studio space, and the support of other people to provide both the artist and the subject with these elements of the classical oil painted portrait. Much acknowledged labor then went into supporting the material situation that enabled these portraits. Someone, in other words, built the studio, prepared the food, produced materials, and secured the privilege of time and space necessary for both the artist and the subject to come together to make a painting. Classical portraiture entails, then, the aesthetic <laughs> act of decontextualizing, or cropping out, a figure along with selected surroundings from everyday life and then recontextualizing or literally framing that figure in a public space of honor, often complete with elaborate gilt frame, artistic signature, and reverential viewers. Take, for example, the framing function of Gilbert Stuart's famous 1810 portrait of George Washington, 
This portrait institutes our <clears throat> shared iconic image of who we recognize as an important American. Indeed, this version of what we have learned is the prototypical picture of a founding father has been reinforced through the dissemination of this very image on the American $1 bill. More than simply a picture of Washington then, this portrait bespeaks through the medium of oil painting and a heavily gilded frame that it is a deliberate and <coughs> enduring substantial material object properly presented in an honored public setting. In fact, a version of this portrait hangs currently in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., and I'll refer more to the importance of the National Portrait Gallery later on in my talk. The 2005 portrait by the artist Doug Auld, which is part of his series called State of Grace, achieves part of its cultural work from the visual intertextuality with the familiar portrait of George Washington and other similar portraits. The subject of Doug Auld's portrait is a woman named Shayla, a black woman with significant facial burn scars. Doug Auld uses the familiar conventions of traditional portraiture, such as realism, texture, color, pose, and likeness, to portray a very unconventional subject. Shayla's image is cropped and posed in a familiar portrait configuration, quite similar to that of Washington, in both Gilbert Stewart's famous portrait and the picture of him on the $1 bill. Both are partial profile bust poses. Both subjects appear against a staid, rich, brown, dignified background, which accentuates their distinctive faces. Both portraits accentuate hair and facial features to achieve the particularity that creates resemblance. Both employ the distinctive texture and color produced by oil painting and brush strokes. All this visual intertextuality establishes pictorial authority for Shayla's portrait at the same time that it highlights subtle differences between the two pictures. Washington's head, for example, is crowned with a wig that marks 18th century European American masculine high status. Shayla's hair similarly marks her very different status as a contemporary woman of African heritage and as a burn survivor. The textured swirls of color that represent scars scatter among the coils of tight, intricate braids that sprout from her scalp. Another subtle but significant difference in the twin portraits is that Washington's partial profile bust pose invites a distanced eye contact between viewer and subject, suggesting, suggestive of a monarchical, that is to say a monarch's, disengaged superiority. And his upper chest displays a dress collar that marks him not as a king, but as a very elite citizen from the 18th century. Shayla, in contrast, faces in the opposite direction, suggesting the disconcerting resemblance of a mirror image. More important, perhaps, is that her artist, Doug Auld, frames Shayla more closely and a much more engaged, indeed a demanding, eye comportment with the viewer. This intense eye-to-eye -eye engagement with the viewer can make a subject seem to reach out of the picture with a preemptive ocular ardor. Shayla is, in fact, staring back at her viewer, refusing to relinquish the visual connection through which the mutual recognition and reciprocal accord of shared humanness occurs. Refusing to wilt under another's stare is a way to insist on one's dignity and worth. Shayla's eyes are steady on us, emerging from beneath furrowed brows, out of a stern face, variegated with intricate brush strokes and colors, which <laughs> announce the residues of burning. Shayla is staring hard back at her viewers. <clears throat> 
Her look refuses the victim role or the distanced medical subject. So as the realism of portraiture does its work of making a likeness of Shayla, we, her viewers, come to recognize the effects of burning on flesh. The iconic aspects of Shayla's portrayal then literally frame the viewer's reception of a visual subject rarely seen outside of medical textbooks or charity pleas, but almost never through the conventions of elite art. Pose. As with Doug Auld's portrait of Shayla, expected poses announce to viewers that subjects are dignified and worthy of our contemplation. In a series of formal drawings called <coughs> The Lost Portraits, the artist Chris Rush pictures what he calls unusual children and adults in studies from life that he did at a facility for disabled people where he volunteers. Chris Rush's drawings use the conventions of classical portraiture, especially pose, to confer dignity on subjects who have traditionally been seen through the conventions of medical or scientific representation. <coughs> like Doug's, Doug Auld's burn survivors, Chris Rush's subjects bear the visual characteristics of pathologized conditions here ones that are stigmatized as mental retardation. Whereas Doug Auld uses bold texture and color and oil painting to render scarred flesh perhaps less shocking but still compelling, the artist Chris Rush softens the presentation of his subject's particularities through the medium of Conte crayon and he poses them with great dignity. One of Russia's most arresting drawings, in my opinion, is called Swim 2, which I'm presenting to you. It shows a young woman in a regal profile pose characteristic of the familiar commemorative portraits of the Italian Renaissance. Russia's portrait of the young disabled woman draws meaning from the visual reference, the intertextuality, to many canonical works of art such as this portrait of a young woman painted in the 15th century. Like one of her Renaissance predecessors, this young woman's <coughs> individual likeness, as well as her social status, emerges from the sharp line that her stately features form against the background. Her nose and chin lift imperially. Her eyes gaze impassively, impassively out on the world beneath her. Her head is turbaned with a richly colored and ornately patterned aristocratic headdress, and her shoulders reveal an elegant brocade gown. Yet, along with the familiar comportment of the Renaissance lady, we glean something different about this portrait, this swim too. The turban in Swim 2 is, in fact, we come to see a bright beach towel wrapped around her hair. The gown is a simple bathing suit. Her adornment, a heart tattooed on her shoulder. Her eyes in a faraway reverie and her profiled face in which we see the distinct features of a person with Down syndrome. The same conventions of portraiture that frame, pose, and costume the recognizable aristocratic Florentine beauty work together here in Swim 2 to grant a familiar contemplative dignity and social capital to a subject for whom it is usually denied. Indeed, Chris Rush's towel turbaned woman belongs to a group of people whose lives are routinely thought to be so unlivable and unworthy that they merit merit the development and the use of routine reproductive technological tests to detect and advance these people and to eliminate them from our human community. The common narratives of inferiority, misfortune, and devaluation that accrue to people with developmental disabilities cannot, therefore, sit comfortably 
upon a woman presented by this portrait. As such, Swim 2, I want to suggest, mediates between our collective cultural <laughs> images of elite beauties and our collective cultural understandings of the supposedly retarded and misshapen. Pose, then, is crucial to a portrait's meaning, but also to its legibility, to the process of recognition of the subject by the viewer that's fundamental to the cultural work of portraiture. As we've seen, frame and costume augment the work of pose so that the entirety of the subject's presentation functions as a single legible image. The portrait of author and disability activist Susan Nussbaum, painted by the artist Riva Lehrer in 1998 as part of a series called Circle Stories, brings together pose and costume, what I like to call comportment, and that offers an intertextual reference that increases the portrait's legibility. The artist costumes the subject, Susan Nussbaum, casually marking her with an artsy, ethnic-looking shawl and surrounding her with the floating objects of her trade as an artist, her history and her status, as is customary in conventional portraits. Most distinctive of Susan Nussbaum's, Nussbaum's costuming here is, of course, her wheelchair, in which she is deeply settled with her arthritis-shaped arthritis hands comfortably and casually foregrounded. The particularity of her hands and her wheelchair, along with the surrounding objects, assure a kind of idiosyncratic rather than a generic reading of her figure. To counter the persistent cultural narrative of wheelchair users as either bound or confined to their wheelchairs through disability, Riva Lehrer's portrait invokes visual intertextuality to impose on the picture of Susan Nussbaum the comportment of the renowned, the comportment of renowned authorship that is established by Pablo Picasso's famous 1906 portrait of the writer Gertrude Stein, one of 20th century modernism's most recognized authors. Nussbaum's pose replicates Gertrude Stein's Buddha-like solidity, also the engaged, forward-leaning body, and the eager, capable, yet distinctive hands. These are no delicate, ultra-feminine Barbie doll girls, so valued in contemporary society, but rather they are generative, womanly, fertility goddess figures. Picasso's icon of modern authorship then overwrites the pitiable image of the cripple that a wheelchair often calls up in almost any viewer acculturated by telethons, charity campaigns, and images of beggars. Costume. Another portrait in Riva Lehrer's series called Circle Stories um, this is a series of disability rights movement leaders, as I suggested, uses wheelchairs as the canonical symbol of disability as she costumes the Chicago activists Mike Irvin and Anna Stoneham in her 1989 double portrait of this couple. So whereas Susan Nussbaum's uh, sense of solid presence comes from her bodily comportment, this, in this, this portrait of Irvin and Stoneham gains material authority through their seating in these throne-like power wheelchairs. The portraiture convention of emphasizing status through symbolic background continues here in the extravagant lightning display in the sky behind <coughs> the couple's power wheelchairs, creating what I think is a charming visual play on the concept of power. Even though Irvin and Stoneham are costumed in the jeans and the casual shirts of contemporary countercultural activist artists, an intertextual reference to aristocratic or even monarchical costuming and pose, characteristic of the double portrait 
assures that viewers do not read this couple as street beggars or hospital residents. Rivalera's portrait imposes then on Irvin and Stoneham the distinction and the status conveyed in double portraits such as this anonymous 17th century portrait from the French school. These portraits typically picture a high status couple posed, in seat, posed seated at equal height, dressed similarly in the costuming of their rank, and touching hands to signify the unity and the sharing of their power and position. Finally, likeness. In portraits of people with disabilities, the canonical disability costume of a wheelchair can be used to produce the likeness essential to the cultural work of portraits. Likeness enables identification of the subject <coughs> by representing the particularities of the subject's face and body, including costuming props and bodily decoration through realistic conventions so as to have the effect of authenticity. The portrait of Christopher Reeve by Sasha Newley, painted in 2004, shortly before Christopher Reeve's death, uses likeness to achieve recognition, perhaps most apparently of all these examples here, by rendering its subject's distinctive particularities. In doing so, this portrait of Christopher Reeve, who I will remind you, of course, is the former Superman, exemplifies the potential for traditional portraiture to confer dignity and authority on subjects from which they have been traditionally withheld. Reeve was a re recognizable celebrity in popular media before he became a disabled wheelchair wearer. That's one of my favorite terms. Sasha Nuli's conventionally rendered and framed portrait, which is displayed in the contemporary area of the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., presents a recognizably disabled Christopher Reeve in a full body pose, typical of the official portraits that fill these classical spaces of national honor. With Reeve's portrait, however, conventional forms present very unconventional content. As in traditional portraits, the pose displays the symbols of the subject's status. We could refer here uh, to the picture I showed you uh, at the beginning of Napoleon, which is uh, actually seated in his throne, which I think is, uh, does intertextual work with this kind of portrait. Instead of a business suit, the usual uniform of modern power, Christopher Reeve wears a power wheelchair, the canonical costume of contemporary disability. As an emblem of his status, his wheelchair functions symbolically as a substantial high-tech throne crafted to the particularities of his body to sustain his rather regal bearing. Another insignia of his status as a person with a disability is Christopher Reeve's respirator, resting with some dignity at his throat like a contemporary man's tie or perhaps George Washington's collar. Reeve's shaved head simultaneously suggests the fashionable look of contemporary male athletes and the baldness result resulting from medical treatment. The monarchical pose brings forward as the center of attention Reeve's legs and feet which are supported amply by his wheelchair. His hands rest in nests that conform comfort comfortably to their shape. His face, the usual site of recognition in portraits, retires here to the background. His noble head is crowned by a modest headrest curving from behind his ear. Like the subjects of traditional elite portraits, the setting emblematizes Reeves' status, placing him in a private but a formal space graced with an oriental rug with which he shares the sculpture with which he shares the sculpture of a sailboat, all brightly brightly lit by large windows in the background. <coughs> 
This contrasts sharply with the stereotypic typical image of the so-called wheelchair-bound beggar or medical patient. The medium of oil painting and pastoral, pardon me, the medium of oil painting textures and colors Reeves' image, alluding to impressionist alfresco painting and pastoral settings, countering the common assumption that disability confines or secludes. Reeves' seated pose invo invokes yet another intertextual reference that confirms his position as an honored leader. The famous statue of a contemplative Abraham Lincoln ensconced in the Lincoln Memorial, again in Washington, D.C., works <coughs> against the conventional presentation of upright comportment as a signifier of high status. The wheelchair is, on the most obvious level, of course, a symbol of Reeve's status as a person with a disability. Reeve is the only explicitly, that is to say, visibly marked subject person with disabilities in the National Portrait Gallery, which is how the portrait invites readers to view him. I would invite us to read Christopher Reeve's presentation here, and this is the important point, not as a symbol of vulnerability as disability, but rather as a materialization of the relationship between body and environment that we all share equally. The cradling of all of Reeve's appendages from head to feet in what might be called material mediations between flesh and world literally render a picture of our shared human experience of embodiment, of flesh accommodated by world, of a sustaining fit between self and situation. Moreover, because the work of portraiture is to present a figure at once recognizable yet representative, the picture invites viewers to identify with Reeve as a figure both above them and of them, as less the exception and more the rule, perhaps. The boldness of this portrait is, then, that it enlists a conventional visual genre to make explicit what is usually hidden in dominant representations. This traditional portrait presents, then, the truth of our enfleshment, of our universal need for sustenance, and it accords that truth, dignity, and status. Reeves' portrait at the National Portrait Gallery also calls, of course, to a relationship of visual intertextuality with his former iconic role as Superman, which circulated widely in a variety of media and popular culture, imprinted in imprinting in the collective cultural imagination the image of the fantastical, flying, super-abled superhero, clad in a futuristic red and blue leotard and cape with a signature yellow S power crest on the chest, the figure of Superman emerged as a mythic comic book hero in 1938 and continued as a man of steel endowed with superhuman strength, flight capability, and an extraterrestrial genealogy in various media and commercial incarnations continuing up to the present, of course. Superman's capacity to transform from the mild-mannered, nearsighted, unremarkable news reporter Clark Kent into the extraordinarily abled, gravity-defying hero took an iconic and ironic turn when Christopher Reeve, who'd occupied the role of Superman from 1978 to 1987, instantaneously transformed in 1995 into a person with quadriplegia as a result of a sporting accident in which the all-too-human Christopher Reeve was bested by the forces of gravity that his fictional persona of Superman would have easily transcended. And of course, this is an example where reality outstrips fiction in its uh, capacity to create 
an amazing story. The residual iconic image of an airborne rocket-like Superman in a hypermasculine fist-forward pose <coughs> of indomitable thrust informs then, I want to suggest, our collective reception of Sasha Nuli's serene and dignified 2004 portrait of Christopher Reeve, who becomes, through this juxtaposition, a man of steel in a very different way. Sasha Nuli's representation of Reeve retracts then and re-choreographs, so to speak, <coughs> Superman's phallic pose, <coughs> offering up in the picture's foreground soft, fleshly hands and legs that are supported by, rather than forged from, rigid, unforgiving iron. The literally penetrating head of Superman recedes to the background in Sasha Nuli's quieted and contemplative Christopher Reeve, rendering him more as every man than as Superman. The cultural work, then, of this portrait depends on the reference to and the contrast with the widely disseminated image that we have in our heads as of Reeve as Superman that haunts the viewer's reception of the aesthetic act of commemoration and honoring that Sasha Newley's formal portrait confers. Likeness, then, Redger renders legible not only the individual person that a portrait displays, but also the group memberships to which the subject, the portrait, belongs through both self and belongs to through both self-identification and social ascription. The conventions employed, employed render the particularities of the subject and its surrounding context to accomplish this recognition, a concept I've been stressing. In other words, Sasha Nuli's portrait wants viewers to simultaneously recognize Christopher Reeve the celebrity and Christopher Reeve the person with quadriplegia. <coughs> Moreover, the placement of Christopher Reeve's portrait in the exhibit hall of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., National Portrait Gallery, immediately adjacent, and this is where it hangs, next to the portraits of American civil rights leaders such as Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, and these are the portraits that hang um, on either side of Christopher Reeve's portrait, instruct viewers to recognize disability as a civil rights issue rather than a medical problem. Just one second. What Brian S. Turner, the sociologist, terms critical recognition theory, focuses our conversation of how aesthetic products such as portraits can accomplish ethical and progressive political work. Turner argues that care and respect for other people and their cultures cannot take place without a prior recognition of them as human beings. By making possible recognitions of subjects as worthy of respect and at the same time disabled, these portraits that I shared with you today, I want to suggest, enable us to recognize disability in new and progressive ways. The political philosopher Nancy Fraser argues that recognition is essential, not simply for individual self-realization, but more importantly as what she calls the cornerstone of an ethical political society. According to Fraser, one becomes an individual subject only in virtue of recognizing and being recognized by another subject. <coughs> the key in the recognition process that enacts Fraser's what she calls ideal reciprocal relation between subjects is for the majority to perceive the minority's distinctive characteristics. And it's this concept of distinctive characteristics that is important to recognition. In other words, to be recognized is to be seen as one is. 
these distinctive characteristics of disability are highly discredited embodied traits and ways of interacting with the world which are represented largely negatively in public culture. Thus, disability is a state of being and a social assignment to which few willingly go or embrace or even sometimes accommodate. In conclusion, by invoking the authority of traditional aesthetic conventions, such as likeness, pose, frame, and costume, to render the particularities of the body that we understand as disabilities, these portraits that I shared with you today invite viewers to recognize what we have collectively learned through our common acculturation to understand as devalued human variations. In doing so, I suggest that these portraits make newly intelligible for minority forms of human embodiment. And they, pardon me, make newly intelligible minority forms of human embodiment, and they promote new forms of cultural literacy. These pictures want to be seen. They want viewers to recognize the distinctiveness of disability, not as dismin diminishment, but as rather testimonies to our shared humanness. Thank you for your attention in this rather long presentation. Do we have time for comments and questions? Oh, good. Or receive some comments. I should say that my readings of these portraits as positive representations is actually rather controversial. Um, some people feel that, uh, for example, these. Um, this series of burn survivors painted by Doug All. This is another one up in the corner uh, of a man named Alvaro. Uh, are actually quite grotesque in their representation. This is an argument I've heard over and over again. The figure that I showed you before, the uh, called Vamp of the young woman with the unusual in face, is how I talk about it. Um, I think terms like uh, disfigurement do a, a lot of negative cultural work that I would prefer not to do. Um, <laughs> This has been, in sometimes when I show it, criticized as a kind of freak show uh, that does uh, counterproductive uh, cultural and political work. Um, a <coughs> colleague of mine uh, who uh, is, uh, was an activist um, in the disability rights movement found the picture of Christopher Reeve to be horrible. He found it uh, very um, disquieting. Well, it is disquieting. But he found it uh, very unappealing, uh, and he found it grotesque. So this invocation of, of the, the cultural tradition of the, of the grotesque is, uh, is part of our uh, learned aesthetic reaction as well. And it becomes a, a kind of, these are very charged, uh, sometimes uh, considered sensationalist uh, forms of representation. So. Um, if you disagree with my reading, feel free to bring that forward. Any comments or questions? Comments or questions? Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if any of these artists themselves are perceived to have disabilities, and if so, how you think that changes the dynamic of these portraits? This is a really good question. It, uh, she asked whether uh, some of the artists uh, identify as disabled, and if that changes the context of the of the um, reception of the work, and absolutely uh, the authorial um, identity of all producers of aesthetic products, artists and writers, their um, the identity their identity affiliation always affects the reception of work. So in the case of Riva Lehrer, who painted this uh, picture on the right-hand side that I'm showing you of a woman with um, what is sometimes called brittle bone disease, um, Riva Lehrer identifies as a person with a disability. 
she, uh, if you want to look her up on the internet, she has done some really interesting self uh, portraits. Uh, and so her uh, series of paintings that represent leaders from the disability rights movement was very intentional in that she wanted to bring forward portraits of leadership in the same way, very intentionally, that uh, people who paint famous people uh, bring forward. Um, and of course it affects the reception and the understanding of these portraits when you know that Riva Lair is someone who identifies as a disabled artist and a woman with a disability. Uh, both Chris Rush and Doug Auld do not identify as people with disabilities, um, which is another way of saying they don't have disabilities. They don't present themselves in this way. And in some sense, um, that makes a much more controversial relationship between their subjects and themselves as artists, because it suggests a kind of um, <clears throat> um, unequal power dynamic. So Doug Auld's project, which is quite interesting, of the burn survivors, uh, the story that he tells is that um, when he was a younger man, before he became an artist, he was um, out in a public space in a marketplace or something like that. And he simply crossed paths with a young girl who had significant facial burn scarring. And of course he'd never seen anybody with significant facial burn scarring as most of us haven't. This is a very much of a minority form of embodiment. And when he saw her, he was of course shocked and arrested visually and he averted his eyes from her gaze and passed on. <clears throat> and that denial of human recognition haunted him for a long time. And when he became an artist, he decided that he was going to address this issue by paint, trying to paint portraits of people who are burn survivors. So he went to a burn center and uh, in New Jersey, I think, and he asked for volunteers of people who were associated with this burn center to see if they wanted to have their portraits painted. And so many people came forward. There must be maybe 20 pictures in, maybe not quite that many, in this series. And they said, yes, I want you to paint my portrait. So they weren't commissioning him in that sense. They didn't pay him money to paint their portrait, which is often the case that there's a financial exchange. But they wanted to tell their stories. So the portraits are all accompanied by the narratives authored by the subjects of the paintings themselves. And they want to tell their stories, and they want to say, this is who I am, this is what happened to me, and I want to be out there um, mediated, I want an image of myself out in the world mediated through this aesthetic um, uh, medium of a portrait to make it easier for the world to see me, basically. Um, which is what these achieve. So that's quite a different project from Chris Rush's project, which he didn't ever really understand to be about disability in any way. Um, he likes to paint unusual things, and um, he found these people to be unusual and interesting. It's a really wonderful series. If you go to his uh, website, you can see lots of, of, of his paintings. And um, when well, I actually said to him, gee, these are paintings of people with disabilities. He very much resisted the idea that there was political content to the paintings. He said, I didn't intend these to be making any kind of a statement about disability. And I said, well, yes, that, that's fine, but that doesn't matter. They do make a statement about disability. And um, I'm glad you made it. And, um, but there was some resistance to some people um, who are disability activists who felt that it was inappropriate and exploitative of him to make these paintings because there was some issue about consent and the collaborative aspect of the, of the paintings. I mean, I think they do really interesting cultural work, but there was some resistance to that. So that's a long answer to your good question. Thank you for asking. There were some, did you have a question? I'll just, I'll just Invites us to look in a way that is really different from 
say, it's like, it's, it's always fine to stare at a painting. It's a sign that you're doing a good job. Right? It's you're an invitation to stare. We're supposed to stare at these, right? And these are not, they're not actually people, they're portraits, uh, you know, in the sense that they're representations we're invited to look at. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the politics of staring. Sure, thank you. Um, about the politics of staring, these, of course, are staged staring situations uh, in which a viewer is invited to stare at, at disability, basically. Um, and so they navigate around, and particularly these burn portraits, and also the, um, the Rivalera's portraits of the disability rights uh, leadership, they navigate around the uncomfortable social situation of face-to-face -face staring relationships in public. And I've written extensively, extensively on this because I think it's a really interesting and generative um, occasion for social meaning-making in this particular moment of modern life when we all spend a lot of time encountering people that we're unfamiliar with. In other words, in, um, in modern times, we spend most of our days face to face with people we've never seen before. Where in traditional societies, you spent most of your time face to face with people that you knew, that were in your village, that were in your um, kinship circle, that you've seen your whole life. So it's a very specific <coughs> Soci uh, historical and um, geographical situation, this business of us encountering each other um, all day long, encountering strangers basically all day long. And my argument is that this <clears throat> has been, this strangeness of this encounter has been intensified over the last 40 or 50 years in many places, including the United States, in that lots of people that weren't in the public sphere before are now in the public sphere so that all of us are <coughs> surrounded more and more with people with whom we are unfamiliar. So, for example, um, many of us may never in our lives have seen somebody with burn scarring, but due to disability rights legislation, people with burn scarring are actually out and about on the street more than they would have ever been in the past because it was the practice that people with so-called disfigurement were actually institutionalized and kind of kept out of public spaces for a variety of different reasons. So this makes these encounters between people who are different from one another much more common than they ever were before. And we have, of course, developed um, as we do in any society, a whole set of restrictions um, uh, around bodily functions. So staring is a bodily function in the sense that we stare at things that interest us, we stare at things that we've never seen before, we stare at things that are called by social psychologists novel stimuli. So staring itself is an urge like breathing or other kind of bodily uh, sort of actions and, and, and impulses, but it's highly regulated, as all bodily impulses are, by society. So one of the things we all know about staring is that you're actually not supposed to do it. It's understand, understood as rude, intrusive, uh, inappropriate, a kind of challenge of authority. And so we all have a lot of work to do managing our eye comportment when we're out in public space. And, um, so I wanted to think a bit about these staring encounters between starers, that is all of us, and what I call expert starees, that is to say people who really spend a lot of time getting stared at and who develop really good management strategies. They become what I call expert starees because they're the ones that know <coughs> how to manage these encounters because they're in them all the time. And so I wanted to kind of think about putting the staree, a word I had to make up, um, in the position of being the expert, in the position of one who's managing this social relation, which I think is true. And when I talk to people who are expert starees, I learned that that was indeed true and that the starers are not 
dominators, but rather are people who are themselves befuddled and also uncomfortable because they really want to stare, but they know they're not supposed to stare and they're not used to managing that relationship. So that's what I was trying to do in my work on staring. Um, and so I worked on people like uh, a man named David Roach, who's a stand-up comedian and has an extraordinarily unusual face. And he says, look, I get stared at all day long, every day, no matter where I am, so I might as well be up on stage and use this opportunity to make some points and get done what it is that I want to do and also in some ways make a living. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, individually that you might have and good luck. <laughs>